if we step back and look at the big picture, I think the great majority of economists don't even understand money. Uh, and, uh, and if you look at it, uh, the only people that came close to understanding money are the Austrians. But the Austrians didn't have the internet, semiconductors, and cryptography. So, so uh, the, the theoretical, you know, perfect money is, is a shared, immutable, uh, true ledger, right? And nobody in the history of the world created a shared, immutable, true ledger, right? The closest thing is if a philosopher king ran the monetary system and they were fair, and equitable, maybe, but uh, you know that only happens for short periods of time, and then and then they get deposed or they die or they whatever. And generally, that we don't see that, and uh, and so that being the case, the closest thing to something that was effective money was sort of maybe gold or maybe sort of a credit system run by a philosopher king, but it's not until Satoshi develops Bitcoin that you actually have an example of a shared, immortable, uh, true ledger system you know, or fair ledger system that, that's uh, conservative. And by conservative, I mean like uh, thermodynamically or physically conservative, like not leaking energy. So because we never had um, a proper money, then I don't think any classically trained economist could have developed uh, an engineer, a, a physically grounded or mathematically grounded understanding of monetary economics. We might be debating that for a thousand years. And so if we come to Bitcoin, you can solve the problem of uh, impaired capital, right? Let, let, let's come back to the elephant in the room. The capital markets are defective. Um, the existing traditional finance capital markets, they operate something like, you know, 19% of the time, right? Uh, from 9.30 in the morning till 4 in the afternoon, Monday through Friday, you basically got, you know, 32.5 hours, right? 32.5 hours out of 168 hours a week the capital markets function in the United States. So they function that way, but they only function that way for about 10% of the people in the world, right? Maybe 800 million people have access to that capital market at best. So what you've really got is a 2% solution. You've got a 10th of the, of the world, you know, that's able to access the markets 20% of the time how does someone in China access the U.S. capital markets? How does someone in Asia or Africa? How, how, how does an Australian access the U.S. capital markets during uh, working hours in Australia? How does an American access the U.S. capital markets on the weekend? Right? There is no capital. There is no the, the money markets shut down. The capital markets shut down. There's no liquidity. There's no leverage. Also, all of the assets that circulate on those capital markets are, for the most part, currency derivatives. So under the best of circumstances, there are USD currency derivatives that are bleeding 7% of their economic energy a year. So what you have is, is uh, capital markets available to 2% of the world. There are gatekeepers that, you know, there are circuit breakers. Like, look what happened the other day where the Tokyo Stock Exchange, the futures ripped up and they, sh and they shut down the futures market and shut down the stock exchange, <laughs> right? And look at the bond markets. The number one capital asset uh, in the world is the US T-bill. It's not liquid and, and uh, functioning 24-7, 365. So the only capital market that is 24-7, 365 that's functioning is Bitcoin. Right, Bitcoin is digital capital. It is uh, open to the entire world. It is uh, egalitarian. It is uh, it is programmable. It's intelligent, right? And and in that particular, and it's true, right? It is, uh, and that makes it very volatile. But the volatility attracts market makers. 
<clears throat> and that's why someone will actually post $20 billion of collateral and they'll give you $20 billion of liquidity on Sunday afternoon during the worst financial crisis of the year. On Welcome back to Crypto Insights. In this video, we will bring you the key insights and main observations from Michael Saylor's latest interview. Before we continue with the highlights, big shout out to Gemini Crypto Exchange, our new partner, one of the most trusted and secure platforms in the crypto world. Make sure to check the link in the video description for a nice sign-up bonus and for supporting the channel. Let's take this journey to the next level together. Time is money, so don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell to stay updated on the latest developments in the crypto space. On a day when everyone else is afraid to do anything, you can actually find billions and billions of dollars of credit or liquidity. It, it, if you... If you actually needed to travel to Tokyo and on Sunday afternoon, someone held a gun to your head and you needed to liquidate 25% of your assets for cash in an hour, you can do that with Bitcoin. You cannot do that with uh, bonds, equity, real estate, gold, diamonds, f fill in the blank. There's, you know, you probably couldn't even do it with a lot of currencies, right? The banks are closed. So... <laughs> What you have here is you have a 20th century uh, economy running on a crippled system with defective assets. And then you have a digital opportunity where you can actually run uh, on a digital capital that is 100% available, that, is, that has where the capital has a useful life of 10,000 years, not 10 years. Right where the impedance to the transfer, you know, is theoretically close to zero, you know, other than you know whatever taxable issues pop up depending upon your domicile, and uh, and that's the world that we're building right now. That's the opportunity, and so the reason I'm laser like focused on Bitcoin is, I think within thirty years. It's, it's very reasonable within 30 years from when Satoshi launched that network, you could actually introduce a $100 trillion digital capital market that takes us from a 2% solution to a 100% solution, that takes us from a 10, 20 year duration economic life expectancy to a 10,000 year economic life expectancy. So it's something that's achievable. It won't cure cancer. It won't get us to Mars. It won't solve, you know, religious and political and social and ideological differences. Those things have to be solved by somebody else. And I will leave, it's their life's work and maybe they will and maybe they won't. But I rather think I think as a technologist that the breakthroughs in civilization are fire, steel, electricity, petroleum, internal combustion engines, nuclear reactors, airplanes, railroads, right? Straightforward radio, right? Uh, straightforward things, and then Bitcoin, digital capital. These are the breakthroughs. Each one of them came and it made the world a better place, but we still used it to fight wars, and we still use and and you know Stalin used steel, and Stalin used electricity, and so you're you're going to have issues when I so when I say fifty percent of the problems are solved by Bitcoin, I mean that fifty percent of the problems can be solved by digital capital, but the other fifty percent they're going to be the work of corporations and politicians and institutions and intellectuals for the next thousand years. And that's okay. Oh, bonds will still be larger. Equity will still be larger. Real estate will still be larger. I don't, you know, I, I, and, and I, I happen to, to see that there's a dualism in the world that will continue. Um, there will be currency, digital currency, and there will be digital capital. And I believe uh, the digital currency will be whatever is designated as legal tender by the dominant nation states of the world, right? For the, for the reason I pointed out, the tax reason, if China and the United States designate the CNY and the USD as legal tender, 
then you're going to be able to oscillate it at high frequency in an economic transaction with no taxable event. And so it's, it's going to be the dominant currency asset. And on the other hand, Bitcoin will emerge as the dominant capital asset but there are other assets that people want. They're still going to want credit. Companies will, and individuals will still want to borrow money, right? I mean, why wouldn't you want to borrow money? Um, and governments will still want to borrow money. And there will still be companies like Google and Apple, and they will have equity. And there will still be people that want to live in buildings and houses. And there will still be skyscrapers, and commercial buildings. So, so asset classes like commercial real estate, bonds, and equity will continue as long as there are people living in the real world. As long, you know, robots might do all the work, but we'll still have warehouses to put stuff in from the rain and the snow, right? We'll still have airplanes. We'll still have trains. Someone will still securitize them with debt or equity. And there'll still be companies. Apple does something. It creates the iPhone. You can't create the iPhone. And so as long as there is specialization of labor and capitalism, there'll be companies. When the world goes communist, there's no equity. But I, I'm not forecasting a world descended to communism. If all the nation states collapsed and there were no nation states, there would be no designated currency but I'm not forecasting that. I, I, I don't think a world without Apple and without nation states is a good world, right? So I'm not a pure anarchist. So, uh, so I, I don't see the dollar disappearing. You know, it's the dominant currency. If anything, I don't. And I think that when you construct this argument as you know, Bitcoin is against the dollar or Bitcoin is against the currency. I think it's it's unnecessarily confrontational and, and it's not constructive and it misses the point, which is Bitcoin is capital and Bitcoin really is demonetizing real estate, equity portfolios and bond for, for portfolios held as capital. And that's a $400 trillion addressable market, and Bitcoin is one four hundredth of it. And so, you know, if you're going to pick a fight, why don't you just pick a fight with gold and buildings and, and companies that, are, that have overpriced stock? They're not going to arrest you, right? right? They don't have armies. And the truth is, they're really the enemy. I mean, the enemy is is I invested $400 trillion into real estate buildings and overvalued companies, and I could have just put it into Bitcoin, and Bitcoin would be worth $400 trillion instead of $1 trillion. So why don't you just focus upon that? Because eliminating banks and eliminating the government comes with a lot of other problems. Like, like what are you going to do when the government collapses – and this anarchy in the street and the police all go home and everybody gets to be their own policeman. And, and you know, it's like, it's a, it's a nice, it's a nice uh, fantasy that you're going to defend yourself with a gun. But the way it really works in war is someone over the horizon sprays a bunch of bullets over the hill and they hit you not even knowing they killed you. Right. It's like, you're not defending yourself against anything when anarchy breaks out because they're just going to set the city on fire, right? You, you can't shoot a fire with a bullet. And so it's in our best interest not to encourage anarchy. It's in our best interest to actually, instead of praying for the collapse of your bank, of the corporation and of the country, it's a better idea that you fix the bank, fix the corporation, fix the country. And when you've got someone in your family that uh, you disagree with and they're unhappy, it's better to make them happy than it is to go to war with them. And so, you know, just like anything else, you know, it's like try to figure out why these bad things happen and then fix the underlying cause. And, <clears throat> and you would say, and I would agree, a lot of times the underlying cause is bad, bad money, right? Broken money is an underlying cause. It's not the only cause, right? Like, 
like uh, the the fact that the company failed and everybody in your city lost their job because they didn't have a treasury, that can be fixed by recapitalizing the company with Bitcoin. But you know you can't fix the fact that the company creates defective products that nobody wants to buy. So so if the problem is the balance sheet, then you fix that. If the problem is the operation or the operational mission. I wanted to sell you, you know, Xerox machines, or I wanted to sell you cameras with film in them, and nobody wants to buy them anymore. You can't fix that, right? That that you just have to bow to reality. Uh, the explanation is, uh, if you look at Bitcoin's performance, it's been uh, compounding at an annual growth rate of about fifty-five percent a year for four years, and the S and P's been compounding at about thirteen percent. So the TradFi, the conventional cost of capital, is 13%. But the digital cost of capital is 55%. And the 13% probably, you know, it, it kind of suggests that the money supply, the currency supply, probably expanded about 10% a year. If you, if you basically assume that companies create 3% productivity a year, then the 13% improvement was maybe 3% productivity, 10% inflation, something like that. And you could debate, is the inflation rate 13% a year or 12 or 11 or 10? But the number is somewhere in the 10 to 13% a year. And I'm just going to say 10%. So as you're inflating the currency supply 10% a year, you know, a, a diversified portfolio of big, uh, of, of powerful companies kind of about tracks it and keeps up or uh, maybe slightly ahead. Most other assets are falling behind. Gold fell behind. Bonds are, you know, down. Bonds are minus 5%. Okay, so uh, what what's the winning strategy? Well, take all of your money, all your treasury, and MicroStrategy had $500 million dollars. At the time, if we'd held it in bonds or invested in bonds, we would have had minus 5% a year. We would have had 400 million, right? So that was a losing strategy. Um, and if we'd rolled it into, into S&P index, we would be up, you know, 30, 40% or whatever, 13% compounded. But the problem is the regula regulations for a public company don't allow you to do that. You're not allowed to, as an operating company, invest in a securities portfolio. So we rolled it into Bitcoin. If you rolled it into Bitcoin, you get a 55% improvement a year. 